someone will come across the video and their first their first impression might be this this crazy bear video that we think is awesome and, but we understand the ethics and whatever and all they see is a bear getting killed with a bunch of dogs around it thinking this is the worst thing ever it's like every whitetail video you see on tv do they explain the ethics of whitetail hunting before the video no they don't have to because most people know now All right, what is up, everybody? I've got Sawyer to my right. Now, Sawyer's been on the podcast before. He's co-host of the podcast before. Jim is over at Vortex Edge, at the Vortex Edge facility right now. I, I, never, I never know what he's doing over there, Sawyer, but I know he's not here. So, But we got, uh, we got a very excellent uh, stand-in, so I'm pretty stoked on that. Yeah, I'm like the pitcher in baseball where someone gets hurt or something, and they bring him in for like one game. And, and then, then he's like, like star- uh n- no, like he's the guy that gets like lit up, and they pull him after like half inning. Then he goes back to AAA, but then someone else gets hurt, and they kind of keep bringing him back. <laughs> up, so <laughs> I I don't know. That, that's that. I'm yeah. setting the bar low. Well, that's good. You want to set yes, that's that's what I do a lot in a lot of my life. You set that bar low, then everything else is just gravy, right? I have found that it translates well to many other things. <laughs> <laughs> that's just good. That's just good life policy. So so are you and I. We're just coming off a turkey hunt here in Wisconsin where it was raining cats and dogs the entire time. It rained cats and dogs the entire time and uh, not super conducive to turkey hunting, but fitting because today we're going to be talking about cats and dogs, specifically hound hunting for cats and dogs. We'll probably get into some bears a little bit, maybe some uh, general how-to stuff or, or just you know about hound hunting. And much like I don't understand the origin of the phrase, it's raining cats and dogs, I think hound hunting is generally, there's a lot of misunderstandings that happen around hound hunting and and what that's about and what it entails. So to help us unpack the topic of hound hunting, we've got Josh and Kirk from The Untamed sitting across from us virtually right now. Uh, expert hound hunters, passionate hound hunters. Guys, if you can, please uh, introduce yourselves. Uh, Josh, we'll, maybe we'll start with you first, and then, and then we'll go to Kirk. We'll go right to left, at least our right to left. And uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about who you are and, and what you guys have going on. How did you decide what right to left was? Uh, when we're vert- Because <laughs> you're on my it. right. <laughs> my right or your right? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, uh, what's up, guys? I'm Josh with The Untamed. And... We've been filming videos on YouTube for about three years. I'm on a lot of focus on hound hunting for bears and mountain lions. And Kirk does a lot of bobcat hunting too. And we love it. I'm Kirk with the untamed as well. Um, like Josh said, we've been going at it for three years. We white tail hunt, turkey hunt, uh, and hound hunt. Um, we do any, any type of legal hunting, uh, you know, uh, in West Virginia or the surrounding states, we we take part in it. So, but a big focus, like Josh said, is is hound hunting for us. Yep. And just to set the primer for this episode too, we met you guys. God, was that two and a half years ago? Yep. Two and a half yeah. years ago at ATA. And the only reason I say that is because those kind of early conversations sparked us continuing to work with you guys, obviously. And for anyone who's unfamiliar with hound hunting or might be on the fence or has their own preconceived notions, I think these are the guys that are going to set the stage for kind of what you know and what you think about hound hunting after listening to this. Like, I think they're the perfect two guys to describe what it is, why they do it, why you should maybe get into it. Um, And I think just really setting the stage for talking about the topic, because as everyone knows, it can be kind of a lightning rod, both inside and outside of the outdoor community. Mm -hmm. So um, these are, these are the guys, these are the guys to talk to. So I'm super pumped with this one. Yeah, it should be a good one. And, and sir, I mean, you brought up like a, th- a thing, you know, you think, um, like among the ranks of hunters, right? You're like, oh, then you, then you're just like good with hunting. Right. And they're definitely, like you said, there's, there's some misconceptions. There's, there's, there's some preconceived notions. There's things that go on there, even with people that, that hunt, you know, and, and I always think of it, uh, y- yeah, it's it's kind of unfortunate, but I feel like hound hunters, like you're always having to defend yourselves, right? Where 
you know, you, in contrast, you take a person, maybe they're, uh, they're an upland bird hunter or something like that, and they've got their leather gloves and they're, they're over under, and, and that's, you know, you're hunting with a dog, right? You're using a dog to uh, pursue game and, and to, to care for and to, you know, essentially be like, you know, your partner in hunting. But, you know, that person gets cast as almost like a, a gentleman hunter role where the hound hunter, like, you know, unfortunately, like, not so much. But, like, so hopefully we can dive into that. Like you said, we'll talk about uh, hound hunting and, and really, um, you know, the intricacies of it and what it's about. And, like you said, man, I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, I think with any other topic, whether it's hunting or hunting or not hunting, um, I think a lack of familiarity often kind of fuels that flame of uh, choosing a side of the fence. So, like I said, I think this is going to be a really good – intro to the sport and why they do it so i'm i'm excited yes what how did you guys you i mean you guys have, like you've been hunters your whole lives um how did how did you guys meet like how did how did you guys connect up and kind of start doing what you're doing hound hunting <laughs> <laughs> was not expecting <laughs> that <laughs> okay that was a simple answer hey, no a- i uh i uh I was, I, I don't come from any hound hunting background, which I think is cool. Um, and really kind of helps uh, help me have a different perspective. Uh, you know, my family hunts every, you know, all the way, every, every grandfather I can think of hunted. Um, you know, we've got rifles passed down from years and years and years, but I don't know anyone that hound hunted and I had never experienced it, never hunted with a dog or anything. And a buddy of mine, um, he was like, Hey, you want to go bear hunt with us sometime with, with hounds. And I was like, sure, sure. You know, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And of course I had these, these same preconceived ideas of like what it was, but I, I had no clue actually what it was until I went and experienced it. Um, and I hadn't consumed much information, you know, much information explaining, you know, how it worked or the ethics behind it or, or even why, why people do it. Um, all I had saw was just guys with dogs and, you know, I thought, man, those those dog those dogs are doing most of the hunting. So I didn't know much about it, and so I uh, I went and rode with Josh. Uh, he was like, "We're gonna ride with this crazy guy. Uh, he's pretty. <laughs> he's, he's he's pretty he's, fun to hunt. He's with. really toned it down since then, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. totally. Just mellowed out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I went with Josh, and uh, I remember that day. Um, it was actually pretty funny. Uh, it just 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 seeing it all go on. Like I remember that day we had a bear go running across in front of us, uh, the truck, uh, while the dogs were chasing it and get to experience that and just to see all the dynamics of it and stuff. But yeah, that was how I, uh, I met Josh was actually through hound hunting. I um, mean, it was my first time ever going. It's not who I, I hunted with. When, like when you, after that experience, like what was like, what were your takeaways then? Like going kind of almost from like, from the outside in, like, oh, I've never, like you're aware of it. Like I'm sure you like seen it on, you know, outdoor programming or whatever, but like didn't know right. anybody, but like, like what was your before and after on that then? Before, uh, you know, like I said, just kind of, um, I really clueless and I just had some ideas, but then after I was like, man, I'm gonna go, I want to try that again. Like that was not what I was expecting. It just action packed, um, a bunch of people involved, which kind of blew me away. Like all the hunting that I had done, you know, usually you may be like, there's maybe at most three people involved, uh, or, or I guess if you're like duck hunting or something like that, you got multiple people in the ground blind, but I was used to just whitetail hunting or having a cameraman. I, my background before that is I had filmed for, uh, the TV show buck commander. And so, I hadn't, I had had zero type of filming experience and I took my camera along that day and just took some photos and stuff like that. Um, but after I just wanted to go again and then that led to me going again and then again and then again, and then next thing you know, someone has a litter of puppies. Well, I tried putting it off, not, not getting one. I don't want one. Don't want one. And then I ended up with one. And so it just was just, this, uh, you know, the more you do it, the more you want to keep doing it. And then and that's where we're, we're we're here today. So did you guys get a bear that first, that first time, Kirk? Yes. Yes. And it was pretty bizarre, um, <laughs> deal because we had a, for another first time hunter there and they, we had the bear tree. Perfect scenario. Perfect scenario. Bear was treed. We got to look at it, determine the size of it and everything. And I thought that was awesome. Like I remember taking a photo of like, you know, my buddy that I, I went with, 
um, taking a picture of him with the bear in the background of the tree, just getting to see the dogs and stuff. And we're just totally relaxed. The bear's setting up on a limb good, you know. And then all of a sudden, Josh is underneath the tree, like pulling dogs off the tree because you always, when you have an animal treed, you grab the hounds and you move them back from the tree. That way, when you shoot it out, the bear falls out. It doesn't land on a dog, you know, common sense. Well, all of a sudden, we're doing that. And all of a sudden, boom, like out of nowhere. No, we didn't know. I didn't know what happened. And next thing you know, the bear's falling, dead, rolls down the hill. Josh is like, what in the world? Well, this first time hunter, they had got him set up. They're preparing him, trying to talk him through the motions. We always give each other, you know, thumbs up, go ahead and all that stuff, boom, he shoots out of nowhere. No heads up for anybody. And it was kind of like, whoa, you know, what just happened there? So, uh, so Josh can tell you a little bit about that. It, it caught us off guard. It caught me way off guard. So do you think getting a bear the first time and kind of seeing the end result, how much did that affect you wanting to continue to do it? Was that a small piece of it, large piece of it? No, I, I, I don't think it was as much as um, – uh, as as the, the I guess the kill itself that didn't that really wasn't exactly what interested me. I did like the part that you could you could you were so close to the bear and you were able to we were determined that it was a boar. Um, it was one we were able to take. I thought that was really cool. Um, instead of just seeing like a bear and be like, oh, it's a good sized bear, I'm going to shoot it. You know, we were able to t- determine a lot about it. But for me, it was just all the stuff that went into it, the tracking the dogs. Um, and, and then before that, I didn't even understand training them and all that. That's a whole different, you know, conversation. But just the the camaraderie, like we were having such a good time that I was like, man, this is something I want to keep doing. Like you said, the contrast between that and like, which I love to deer hunt, actually, and like what you're describing there, like, I think that's the problem anytime I try any new form of hunting is like, then you're like, oh, well, now I want to pick this up too, you know? But, um, but yeah, there's yeah. like a lot, there's definitely like a large, like, a big contrast between that and deer hunting, which I love to do, but that's generally like, a, you know, oftentimes a more solitary experience. Like you're not getting that camaraderie component. You're not necessarily getting that teamwork component. Sometimes you are, sometimes you can, but I mean, this seems, you know, even to, to level that up for sure. So that, yeah, that, that's, that's really cool. Josh, before, we, before we get too deep here, like what's your, what's your hound hunting background? Is that something you just grew up with or, or how did you, how did you get into it? No, I, I grew up, you know, strictly squirrel hunting, deer hunting. I didn't hardly even turkey hunt uh, growing up. And then I went in the Marine Corps and went and really didn't hunt for the several years I was in in the Marine Corps. And when I got out, um, my mom, through a contact of hers, in the northern part of the state, they've been running dogs for bears. For It's been open for years and years. It just opened where we hunt now. It just opened in 2008 to hunt bears with dogs. So the year I got out of the Marine Corps, my mom had set up through one of our family friends for me to go and bear hunt with these guys. I didn't even know that at that time, I didn't, there was no thought about it. Like I, I was just like, heck, I didn't even know they ran bears with dogs at that time. So when I went, it was just a completely new experience for me and had a blast. I mean, when you put the social aspect into it, uh, watching the dogs. Of course, I always loved dogs. And so I hunted for three or four days with those guys up there and, uh, ended up killing a bear, which was no, you know, it's like, it's no big deal. Like I was excited that I killed a bear because that was the first bear I ever killed. But the biggest part is just watching those guys, everything that they had to do to make that happen. And then I left camp. I hunted three or four days and then I hunted for, and that was in uh, 2000 and then got to hunt with some guys that we currently hunt with in the Southern part of the state. Uh, and I think I hunted from 2000 to 2009, maybe without dogs. I just went and hunted with that, with the group. Mm-hmm. I bought, I bought a GPS to where I could track the dogs, but that I hunted for seven or eight years, I think. And I didn't own a hound and I enjoyed it, uh, because I loved just taking off through the woods and taking off behind the dogs on their tracks, especially when there's snow and tracking them and helping them out, 
you know, I, I'd help out anyway, but I didn't have to do any of the taking care of the hounds, going home and feeding and watering when you're out till midnight after running since daylight. I didn't have to have, I didn't have to do any of that. Well, then, you know, when I started getting hounds, I got one, or I think I got maybe two hounds and build up from there. So it was, I hunted, hunted with hounds for seven or eight years before I even owned one myself. Mm-hmm. And, but then once you, once you get, a, once I got a hound and I had some skin in the game, it totally changed my view again. Like I love going out and hunting with those guys and, you know, chasing hounds and bears and stuff. But like, once I got a little skin in the game, even if I did only have two hounds at the time, like it changed my view on it even more. Uh, and I've always been passionate about standing up for it because, you know, hound hunters in general, you know, get a bad rap. I'm not saying that all hound hunters are the most ethical people out there because there's some, there are some hound hunters out there just like any other specific animal hunter out there. If they're white, there's some bad whitetail hunters out there that give whitetail hunters bad raps. And it's the same thing with hound hunting. Um, so, but I, I mean, it's just a, a real passionate thing for me. And so I've been doing it since 2000 and, you know, I was the first person in my family, obviously that's run hounds, but it's my son saw his first tree bear when he was three years old. I packed him in on my shoulders. I had diapers in, in one pocket and wipes in the other, and, <laughs> you know, it's, it's hooked him. You know, he, he still, he still to this day, he's 12 now and he still to this day, you know, goes out and hound hunts and he's never killed a bear. I don't know how many bears he's seen, but he doesn't even care about killing them. He's just out there for the dogs. And that's, and that's, it's kept him in the, out, it introduced him to the outdoors and it's kept him in the outdoors. So that's kind of like my, that's kind of my background. And, uh, it's been very important since he was born, uh, part of our life for he and I to be able to hunt together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, a lot of what you guys are describing there seems to be like a really common theme. Like anytime I talk to, um, hound hunters like it truly is like number one you better be a dog person if you're gonna if you're gonna be a hound hunter you know particularly if you're gonna have have hounds right but it really is about the dogs it's about the relationship with the jaw dogs it's about training the dogs it's about caring for the dogs um and then you know then in the hunt itself right but the the killing of the animal is kind of uh I don't, I, not anti, because I'm sure it's, you know, super exciting. It's not anticlimactic, but it's not, it's not the, the main focus necessarily, even though it is the main focus. I don't know, that, that probably doesn't make sense, but hopefully it makes sense. But, uh, you know, and I think that's how, that's how I feel about it right now. Like, hound hunting is something that I think is super cool. It's something I'm interested in. It's not something I've ever done. So, like, I would, I want to go do that. Because I think, you know, it's always good to broaden your outdoor experiences and, you know, curiosities and get to know or at least get to witness the the intricacies of hound hunting. But, like, I would venture to guess that even if even if I got a bear or let's, let's say I was hunting with you guys, uh, 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 even if I got a bear or a cat. You're trying, you're trying to drop a hint? Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. That was, <laughs> was that subtle enough? Well, I'm just saying, like, I would venture to guess that actually it would be a more fulfilling, like, I think... <laughs> I would get a lot out of it, but I feel like you guys would actually get more out of it, even though I, like, let's say I shot the animal. Like, I don't know, that would be, that would be my speculation of, just because, like, like you were saying, like, you guys have skin in the game. Like, you have, you have that relationship with the dogs. You know, you care for those dogs every day. You've watched them progress, you know, as hounds. Um, so, I don't know. That, that's kind of, that's definitely my thoughts on it. I mean, you, lo- you know, you love your dogs. It's like watching, kind of like watching your kids grow up or progress or something like that. You know, it's always more meaningful to, to the parent of those kids, you know? Mm-hmm. So, is right. what is what you guys do, is, is that something that in the grand scheme a lot of people do? Would you say it's more underground, I guess? What's the current landscape look like of guys running hounds to hunt bears? I would say, I would say it's more on the underground scene. Um, because it does take a lot to do it. Not only does it take land to do it. So if you're fortunate enough to have large sections of public around you to hunt, you can obviously hunt that where we live, uh, you know, just here close to us, there's no big national forest 
there's no large sections of public. I mean, I think the biggest sections of public is like 22,000 acres, but there's zero vehicle access. And without a vehicle, hound hunting is almost impossible to do, um, especially running bears that can run miles and miles and miles. I mean, you can't go on foot behind them, obviously. Um, so, yeah, it, it uh, I don't know. What do you think, Josh? I mean, I think it's a growing sport. Uh, I think that people are picking it up. We've seen it firsthand here and talk to people out of state. I think it's the, the sports growing, it continues to grow. Uh, I know that there's a lot more hound hunters here in the state of West Virginia than there have been. I mean, you used to never see a, a truck with a dog box and a rig rack in it. And now they're all over the place here in Southern West Virginia. Yeah. You know, and I, that's a great thing. Uh, as long as they're out there doing doing the right thing and 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 making the right calls for the right reason, I mean, I don't want to downplay the kill to the listeners at all, because all the kills are are important, and that's you'll hear Kirk and I talk about it probably today, but that's one of the reasons that that it's the most ethical way to to hunt in in reality because you're shooting a an animal that's sitting still in a tree most of the time and they're dead as soon as the triggers pull because it's a headshot and it's done. So I don't want to downplay the kill, but it's not our focus is more on the camaraderie amongst us and watching the dogs and watching and getting our kids. I mean, yeah, I'm sure you all see in our videos. I mean, we get a lot of kids involved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, right. like, it's like a family. It's a family outing. Yeah, I can't tell you like how many how many times that uh, we go a year and it's somebody's first animal, somebody's first experience in the outdoors. And I think that's awesome. I think it gets them hooked. Because um, for us, like like we said, we're not down, down playing the kill, but we're not as excited to shoot a tree bear as someone else might be that's never experienced the outdoors or, or never killed a bear. And so right. we take them along. We get the fulfillment of getting to work our dogs, train our dogs. And then we get the also fulfillment of, letting somebody else shoot the bear that is pumped they are on cloud nine they're like i can't believe it's still this big bear yeah you know? And, you, you know, and we get pumped in our videos a lot because like when these people first timers are uh, out there and they get a bear i mean you, you see the look on their face and i mean it's gonna get you pumped up i mean yeah so i mean that, that's where we get our excitement from and, and passion you know the dogs do good and then we're introducing people to introducing non-hunters to the outdoors or we're introducing hunters to hound hunting mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah for and not, sure. trying to, not, not trying to change people's minds or recruit people to hound hunting but just getting support for it because there's a lot of hunters that don't support hound hunting just and it's the simple reason is is uh inexperience and not wanting to keep an open mind mm-hmm and, and probably some misinformation out there too. Yeah. And that was kind of oh, the, yeah. that was kind of the main reason I asked that question. Like just for the people listening who may be semi familiar with it or not familiar with it at all. I think with the internet and more people getting into it, like you guys mentioned, I think both of those are great things. But you've also got less barrier to entry to uploading a video. And I think for some people that might be. I, I, I think of people as like sitting on a fence and a brisk wind can kind of push them either way. They might not care either way on hound hunting. Um, they might be hunters. They might be non-hunters, but they see one video that goes viral or they see something else on the Internet and, and they're, they're just kind of shut down for life because that's their experience with it. Have you guys seen kind of the messaging around hunting with hounds kind of improve as more people get into it, more people run cameras. How have you guys seen that change kind of the perception of what it is that you guys do? Um, I think, I think one, one good thing about that is like, we also, uh, white tail hunt, we turkey hunt. Uh, so we get a lot of people that are, that'll comment stuff, you know, along the lines of they'll say, you know, Oh, you need those, those dogs to kill that, that bear or whatever. And I'll be like, no, like check out our other videos um we also whitetail hunt we also turkey hunt and then we'll link them to a video explaining to you know explaining what hound hunting is something that was tough for us when we got into this was especially for me being the editor and filming most of it especially at the very very beginning i was filming all of it um was we were producing content for hound hunters 
we weren't producing content for the non-hound hunter. So we're posting videos that we think hound hunters want to see. We, we know. And instead of every video having an explanation of why we were doing this or whatever, someone like you like you said, Sawyer, someone will come across the video and their first, their first impression might be, um, this, this crazy bear video that we think is awesome, and, but we understand the ethics and whatever. And all they see is a bear getting killed with a bunch of dogs around it, thinking this is the worst thing ever. So yeah. there's like a fine line there for us um, that we did. I didn't consider at the beginning uh, because we're trying. It, it, it's weird. It's like it's like every whitetail video you see on TV. Do they explain the ethics of whitetail hunting before the video? No, they don't have to because most people know now, you know. So for us, we're trying to do more stuff and we appreciate guys like you all giving us the platform to uh, reach new people that we haven't we haven't been able to reach before. And I know the hound hunting community, like the fact that Vortex Optics supports us, that's a reflection that Vortex Optics supports hound hunting and wants to educate more people about it. And so not only do we appreciate it, but I'm sure the hound hunting community appreciates everything that you all are doing as far as educating everyone and trying to give you know shine a positive light on hound hunting yeah and we don't have to talk about that too much but i just think that was an important thing to cover right away before we get into more of the nitty-gritty just Mm -hmm. a lot of people you get one one shot with them they see one video they see one article and it's like oh my mind's made up so i think it's just choosing carefully the content that that you watch and associate with and for a brand like vortex who we work with because i i think that's a huge part of taking something from the underground to accepted, more popular, uh, and that type of thing. I think that's huge. Well, yeah, and a lot of it's just, it's just an education thing, right? You know, and, and talking to people um, in, in, in the right way about things so, the, so they can gain an understanding in, in a way that's not, um, you know, not going to push them away, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, so, yeah, I think that's super cool. And we appreciate you guys being involved in the activity and being such a good voice for it and and being able to talk about it in the way that you do that that does uh let folks know you know i guess you know what what hound hunting is about and 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 kirk one thing you touched on earlier which i think is super important is that um you know you were talking about you know essentially being able to determine you know the size age and sex and and kind of a uh, controlled, maybe controlled chaos, or you know, but uh, but you know, once you get that that bear or that lion in the tree, like you've got a minute, you know, you you can you can you get right. you get that time to look at it and evaluate it and know exactly what what you're looking at there. And from a from a conservation or management perspective, you know, you've got a level of sl- selectivity. Um, I'd say, you know, at least in some situations, a higher level of selectivity to where you can, you can determine, yeah, is this an animal that we want to take? Is this, you know, um, you know, I think, uh, in certain, and you guys could probably speak to it better than, than I can, but, you know, take like, uh, an, an area where maybe you're hunting lions, you know, there might be, uh, you know, a, a female quota, you know, so, you know, once that, you know, X amount of females get shot, you know, that might get shut down. So you might say, well, you know, let's, you know, we want to take be cognizant of that so maybe maybe go into that a little bit yeah yeah so it's different for area per area we're in so like when we're for instance uh, when we're mountain lion hunting you're exactly right uh, a lot of units will have a quota of let's just say um, 19 and let's say there's 19 males and four females um, obviously they don't want the females getting killed um, so that's the reason why they have such a low quota on it the, the biologists that are setting those numbers so when we tree, uh, and you'll see in the vortex legs we're coming out with um, on the on the last day of our hunt, um, we tree a female. Uh, we're able to look at it, determine one, it wasn't a very big line, and two, I could tell it was a female. Um, we're able to give her a free pass. Uh, so w- we let her go because uh, that's just really not, that's one, not what we're looking for. But also, we don't want to shut be the ones responsible for shutting down that unit because you have to call and report. Um how you know what it what it is you kill that's how they keep an idea and every day you're supposed to call in check and see what where the quotas are and all that stuff to keep that up to date but where we bear hunt um they've actually opened it up so you get two tags um when you get your license which you got to go and buy a bear damage permit which is only like 10 bucks and 
correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, but didn't they add this year? Um, you have to buy the second permit. That's right. But it's no. only for, for residents, it's only 10 bucks. Yeah. So 20 bucks, you get two tags. Um, we have down here, and, and it's another reason why they opened the hound hunting uh, up in 2008. We have an exploding bear population. I mean, and there's some areas you can go to in Southern West Virginia and see more bears than you do deer, wow. um, which is pretty bizarre. Like I, I didn't grow up in those, like the areas those are, those are at, like I'd hardly ever see a bear. And then you can go in those areas and see bears just everywhere. So we aren't nearly as selective um, in those areas because just speaking with local biologists and game wardens, they want the population reduced. And so that's sometimes you'll see something confusing in our videos. Like, why are they shooting that bear? It's not a very big bear. Well, it depends on what area we're in, you know, and, and, and I think that's something we got to do a, a better job of explaining as to why we're harvesting um, this bear. It's, it, it's not that big, but it is a legal bear and uh, it's a hunter's first bear. We're not going to tell them no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what a lot of people miss too, is the, the management aspect of it. Um, yeah. And then bear, mountain lion like i would consider them very charismatic species too you see them in disney movies you see them as plush toys you uh, see them as all this stuff so i think people in their brain see this as well why the heck would you shoot this beautiful animal but then they see a, a dead turkey or a dead deer they're like oh that's awesome <laughs> like yeah, so there's yeah. there's just a level of there's a lo level of education needed and the other thing that i think even I wasn't super familiar with is just how controlled the variables are when it actually comes to the point where you're pulling the trigger. I would say more so than a lot of deer hunts, honestly. Oh, like, I think it can oh, be. Absolutely. Not, you not talk down about anything else, but I, like I said, it's just, it's an extra, like you, there's just a level of scrutiny that I think you're able to provide that's, that's elevated there. And I think that's, that's super cool. And, and like you said, sir, I mean, these populations are so, tightly managed you know with with a science-based approach and i think that's super and, that, and that's really for all, all all the game animals in north america but um you know it's not just guys going out there and you know letting their dogs go and and uh just getting after it with reckless abandon it's like no there's there's a lot of thought and science that goes into um you know the regulations that that uh pertain to to, to all hunting and and you know in some ways in particular like you these these larger predators i know i was just up in alaska and you know it's like you shoot a deer in wisconsin and y yeah you check it in and they get some some data off that but um you know i shot a bear up there and you know you you got to go in i mean you tag the bear and then you, then you go in and you got to get it sealed and they put another tag on you on your bear they measured the skull they pulled the tooth i mean they're getting a lot of data to help them learn about these animals as well as manage the populations. Um, and, and that data is being provided by, by hunters, right? So, I mean, it's kind of a symbiotic relationship between the hunters and, and, you know, the, you know, the, the state fish and game agencies there. So I think that's definitely imp important to point out as well. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think another big thing that people tend to overlook, and I don't know how it is in West Virginia, but in Wisconsin, the amount of bear human and bear pet conflicts has just continued to rise like we have a very healthy black bear population and i would compare it to bear versus deer again not to harp too much on that but people see four deer in their backyard at the bird feeder they're like oh steve get over here they're they're back they're back and there's a there's a bear in the backyard and they're like <laughs> grab the dog like grab the dog so it's like a level of tolerance for different people whereas a deer in the backyard great a bear in the backyard might be some problems yeah we've learned that you know from our videos and from what we do when we started i mean we were filming strictly here in west virginia west virginia's uh very lenient when it comes to game laws um you know they let you kill a lot of deer let you kill a lot of bear you know there's no legislature i mean we've had it's been surprising the last couple of years on some legislation that's come through but tried to come through but normally legislatures aren't trying to pass game laws with the people in west virginia so we've never had to deal with it so when we were putting videos out we started hearing from all kinds of bear hunters throughout the country going hey man you all need to dial it back a couple of clicks you know because you're you're affecting what we what we're trying to do 
So over three years time, we've seen a change. Wouldn't you think Kirk in a, in a, in a much more positive manner from some of the same groups that reached out to us saying we were doing the wrong thing. Right. A lot of, a lot of bear hunters are, are almost afraid to put any type of content out there because they think any, any content is bad. Like they want to hide. And I think if you go at it with that approach, that it's going to eventually just disappear because people aren't going to care about it. You're not getting more people entertained. What I like about our channel is, um, we, like I said, we white tail hunt, we turkey hunt, we wild boar hunt. So we have a bunch of different viewers and we give them the opportunity to see bear hunting, uh, that, that they may have not never watched the video before, but they like our style of content. So we get more people interested in it. And, and I've had, I can't tell you, and, I, and I'm not saying this to be boastful or, or, you know, bragging, but I think we have introduced so many people, um, to bear hunting, you know, or hound hunting specifically. Um, that are now giving it a try uh, that m- may have never given it a try before um, just because they came across our videos because they liked our turkey videos, but now they're interested in, in, in hound hunting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I really think, I mean, I, and I, I hope that's our goal is, is to one, continue the, the, the tradition of hound hunting for as long as we're alive and, and, and longer than that. And two, you know, just get more people involved and educate them and let them know it may not be what they think it is. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I think that's an important thing to point out as well. Like hound hunting has, I mean, that has a long and storied tradition. You know, it's, it's part of, uh, it's, it's culturally important, uh, in a lot of ways. I'm not, it's not like a a lost art, you know, but there's definitely fewer people that do that to, to carry that tradition on and the knowledge that goes along with it. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think I think that's super neat for sure. And I mean, everyone hates negative comments on social media, right? But I do have this theory in the in the back of my mind that that they are giving you an opportunity to engage that you would have never had before. Maybe they go into that video anti bear hunting, just ripping on the video, ripping on hound hunting, but they are giving you a platform to interact directly with them versus just emailing a anti-hunting group or something like that. So there's something, there's something in the back of their mind that they're like, I'm going to take the time to engage with this. And that's when guys like you are so crucial because you can talk to them on that platform and Mm -hmm. maybe you don't sway them into supporting it, but maybe you stop them from sending an email. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and I, and I think as as a hound hunter too, like your approach to being like, no, we're going to talk to you know, we're we're going to show hound hunting, and if if you hide if you hide from it or treat it like it's not normal, like even a, as a hound hunter, then people are going to perceive it as like, oh, this is like something you should hide from, and it's not a, a normal thing, you know, when when it really truly is. So, um, right, it, it it's absolutely normal. I mean, it's it's any other dog sport that's that's out there that people watch. It's just because of the of the perception that it's cats and dog cats and dogs and bears, and it's just like um, Kurt. You you come you come from uh, duck hunting with the, all those guys when you were filming. How many times did you go duck hunting, and they left the dog at the house? Never. How many times have you all been? And I'm not an upland bird hunter, but how many times have you all been upland bird hunting? And they left their retriever dogs at the house. I mean, that'd be like forgetting your shotgun. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the same concept just on a, a larger animal scale, and, but it's perceived so much differently mm-hmm. uh, through, through the non outdoor and the outdoor industry. Mm-hmm. And it shouldn't be, you know, we're not going to, I don't, you know, I've said it before. I mean, it's just like bear hunters that hunt over bait, right? It's completely legal. If it's legal in your state, man, go for it. Are we going to, I don't know about Kirk. I don't think he is because we're hound hunters, but like, I don't care if you're a bait hunter for bears. Heck, if it's legal, go for it, man. I support you hundred percent, but we have bear hunters get on, you know, our social media and make ignorant comments. Um, because we hound hunt for bears and that's, that's not what the outdoor industry, uh, that shouldn't be their platform to beat each other up. Yeah. And I think people, people don't think about hunting as this huge blob of things. They think about it as little kind of pieces and in, in regions. So when, 
I mean, we saw it, what was that, California, the stuff that, that happened. Like, when one piece gets chipped away, like, they're always going to find a new piece to, to focus in on. So mm-hmm. I think a lot of hunters lose that perspective of, all right, let's all support everything like you jo- like you said, Josh. If it's legal, go for it. If it's ethical, go for it. Uh, and I think people lose sight a lot of that. And those are the, also the same people that are kind of complaining because no one supports hunting anymore. It's mm-hmm. like, well... You're you're actually helping them do that by fracturing these these pieces of the hunting community and going at them, and then it just takes away that whole group. Yep, yep, for sure. And and like what what one did you all one of you all said earlier there? Um, I can't remember who said it, but as far as uh, gathering data, well, uh, and this is kind of off topic, but I just wanted to make sure this before we we left um, that. We, like California, for instance, they have no idea what their mountain lion population is. Like even on their like official like fish and game website, um, it says like an estimate of, of a, a guesstimate of three to five thousand. Um, it's kind of in the range. They really don't know for sure. It could be way more than that. It could be way less than that because they're not being hunted. They're not getting any data um, from hunters to tell them where the cats are. Uh, and in those those states like. New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, they're using that data. All the hunt, these hunters, absolutely. They killed, they were, I mean, this, this unit filled up fast this year. The quota was hit like that. There's probably a lot of cats in that unit. Um, they're able to use that data to, uh, to, to one, protect the population, but either help it grow or reduce. It. Um, so, and that's a hard thing for anti hunters to wrap their head around is like, they're using hunting as a way to help animals you know, help the, the general, the general uh, population, you know, and, and I think that's something they struggle with. And that's the reason why in California, you know, you can't hunt with mountain lions. I mean, you can't hunt dogs with for, for mountain lions. Yeah. Well, and, and Kurt, I think you brought up before this is kind of getting a little bit more into the, you know, I guess the nitty gritty of like, you know, how you guys even go about this, but like, like hound hunting, you know, appears to be, and I think this is true, a very time and, and, and gear and resource uh, intensive uh, activity, like what, like what is even like what's all the equipment? What does the equipment set look like? You know, with with the dogs and and whether that's um, you know collars, GPSs, you know everything that goes into it. Like what do you, what all goes into that? So for one, you have to have a truck. Um, I had an old truck when I first got into it. There, you can ask Josh. I had an old truck upper ball joint fall out of it like something was always going on i had to pay a mechanic to go fix it or whatever so i said forget it i'm going to the dealership and i had a forerunner which i didn't hunt out of and i had an old old like 96 model tacoma uh of course the frame rusted out of it 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 was just it was terrible i took them both to the dealership because i wanted to hound hunt and said give me i want a truck and i want one that's got a warranty and i don't want it to break down because i got tired of dealing with it so one you've got to have a truck so i took a brand new truck and you can ask Josh, it is absolutely gutted. Uh, scratched bumpers fall. I just put a <laughs> brand new bumper on it. Um, so you have to have a truck. Um, you got to have those collars that we use. Uh, like, I mean, you don't, I say you have to. Technically, you do not have to. But in this day and age, you really should have them. Um, because the, the day and the, the times of just listening to where your dogs are and riding on horseback, you know, that's kind of gone. Uh, and those are GPS so, collars, Kirk, you Yes, they're tracking. Name? So we're able to um, we're able to track them on our on our handheld. So you you have to have a collar that communicates to your handheld, which they work off satellites, and that tells you the position of your dog. So those collars, three hundred bucks a pop. So you got ten dogs that three hundred dollars a pop. What is that? Three thousand uh, dollars. And norm, uh, most houndsmen have anywhere from let's say twelve to five to 12 dogs, somewhere in that range. Most houndsmen. Now I know guys in West Virginia that literally have 18 dogs, which in my opinion is too many, but whatever floats your boat. Um, so you got to have a collar for each one of those dogs. And, uh, you, you have to have the handheld, which itself is like, what's the, what's the new alpha 200, like five ninety nine retail. Yeah. There's 600, Well, then you've got to feed your dogs every month. Well, these are working. These are active dogs. You're not going down, and, and this is just my opinion and then how I, 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 you know, tra- train and raise my dogs. I'm not just feeding them the cheapest Purina or the cheapest dog food on the market. Cause they're working dogs. Like I look at them like a professional athlete, you know, I want the best nutrients in their body. So I'm constantly researching what dog food, 
you know, what's in this dog food, looking at the ingredients label, considering protein to fat, um, uh, all those things matter. So I'm feeding a high quality dog food, which costs a lot of money to feed. I've got nine dogs uh, it's to feed nine hounds every month. Um, then you got to consider your kennel. Like, where are you going to keep them? Are you going to keep them on a chain? Are you going to keep them in a kennel? Or you can do what I do, which is not what most people do. Um, I keep mine actually on an electric fence. Um, like, you know, the, the pet safe collars mm -hmm. in my backyard. And you'll see on my Instagram or even the Untamed Instagram, sometimes I put stories up uh, feeding them and stuff like that. They have over an acre to run around a free range. Um, and they're trained just like they are with those Garmin collars um, that we use when we're hunting them. A beep means stop where you're at. And then if they don't, then you, you're able to stimulate with a shot. So they're trained on that um, electric fence. So you got to consider, like, if you don't have that, you got to go out there and every day. And, and luckily, where I've got an acre they can run around, I don't have to go out there and shovel poop and all that stuff. But if you, if you do have kennels, you've got to clean them every single day. Or at least you should. Um, you got to water them. You go on vacation. Like I just got back from Memorial Day weekend. We were in Tennessee. I had to pay someone to come to my house, feed my dogs, take care of them. It's got to be someone you trust. Um, I even put cell cams up, like, a, you know, the texting trail cameras on um, where my dogs hang out just to keep an eye on. Uh, just because, you know, they're they're not a tool to me. They're, they are, uh, they're an extension of my family, you know. How you feel about your house dog Um if you're listening to this, how you feel about your house dog, that connection, that's the similar connection I have to every one of those dogs because I've raised them since they're pups. And that's another thing that's misconceived is like people think hound hunters, they don't care about their dogs or whatever. Well, I'm sure there's people out there, just like there's people that don't care about their house dogs. I'm sure that, that that's the way they feel. But for me personally, that is not, you know, I'm putting all that time and effort into them. I'm going to take care of them. So there's a lot of money. It, it, it's, it's not a hobby. It's a lifestyle for sure. And I'll say that like in a cliche, corny, you know, I feel like that's kind of sounds cliche or corny, but it's not the case at all. Like it truly is a lifestyle and it's something you've got to want to do. And that's why I get a kick out of people saying like, oh, this is a lazy way to hunt or, or they're just clueless. They do not have any idea. I mean, honestly, <laughs> like, like hound hunting to me seems like the most labor intensive hunting that a person could do i mean that like people consider yeah. like oh yeah i'm you know year-round hunting that's or hunting that's a year-round pursuit for me because i'm always thinking about it but i mean you guys literally have i mean you're responsible for those dogs seven days a week turn 65 days a year i mean you are caring for those dogs and not your and you care for those dogs like i mean i think that, like you said i think there's some mis some misconceptions there that oh you don't you know that's just you know this tool that i have to go kill this lion or go kill this bear and and that's just that's just not the case. I mean, you know, and, and I think also something that is worth pointing out. I think some people think that oh, you're making the dogs do something they don't want to do, and I <laughs> and I I'd say you know chasing bears and cats is you know as much if not more in the heart of those dogs as as it is in you guys. Oh, it's more more for sure. You, it, I mean, literally, the dogs can work themselves to to death. I mean, complete ex exhaustion. Um, they absolutely like that. I get a kick out. People are like, they, I, they, you know, that tells me one, they really don't know what they're talking about because they're like, you're making those dogs do that. I'm like, are you kidding me? It's like, we have to keep them from doing it. Like, that's what they're bred into them. That's what they want to do. I mean, these dogs are, the first dog was a descendant from, you know, wolf and, and, and they tamed wolves and were able to, uh, like, uh, anthropologists, this is coming from anthropologists say that they used the original dog to hunt game with and they would wear down the game. And then you come in with spears and finish off the game. Uh, I mean, like this, this is, this is what the dog, this is what they want to do. This is what their original ancestors were doing. And it's, I think it's so cool that we're still using dogs the same way today. No, that is cool. And I think that's, uh, you know, you're talking about, so, I mean, have you guys ever been like, Hey, like you've been on this track for a while. Like we need to get, you need to cool it. Like I, you need to, have you guys ever pulled a dog off a track because you know, you thought they might be getting too tired or wearing themselves out? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's just knowing your dogs and knowing like the situation. It's all situational. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, we absolutely we do pull them off the track sometimes. We don't think they're going to catch it, or it's getting hot out. For the air, another area, the weather. Yeah, there's so many different factors and the reason why we might pull them off. Obviously, you don't want to pull them off, and they definitely don't want to be pulled off. But you just got to decide what's best for them and best for best in the situation. Another thing I didn't add there too is is vet bills um, to the added That's right. added cost of it. Healthcare. Like the other day, the other day I had a dog, and for whatever reason, um, it. it I've never had it happen before, but I had a dog that uh, had a just heat exhaustion, like his sugar levels dropped. Um, he overheated. Well, it was a Sunday. Sunday, there's no local vets uh, offices that are open. And obviously, I've got a good relationship with our vet because I've got so many dogs that, you know, you see him so often for different reasons that I, you got, you know. I've just formed a good relationship with him. So I shoot him a text. Hey, I've got a dog down. Um, he's really dehydrated. He's lethargic. Something's, something's bad wrong. And he said, you know, he wasn't around. So what's that mean? Straight to Charleston, um, which is Charleston, West Virginia, sir. Our, uh, it's the capital of West Virginia. I head to Charleston, um, drive an hour and a half to get there from where I was and take him to the emergency vet. That's the only emergency vet close to us. So that's like 400 bucks, bam, as soon as you walk through the door because it's that special care. And that ended up, that one day right there cost me 1200 bucks. Just like that. And so you've got to be, like you you financially got to be prepared for uh, anything because, uh, I mean, it, it can, you just, you just never know what's going to happen. So knowing that those dogs are highly trained, can you walk through like what's going through your brain when, when you're on a track or you've got them out running? Is there a level of anxiety knowing that your dogs are out there, like kind of walk us through what's going through your brain. Are you thinking about every dog individually and like their strengths or when you see them on the map and they're getting far away, uh, is there a level of anxiety there or is that kind of just par for the course? I don't have a level of anxiety. Um, I, I pretty much let mine do what they're going to do. I get, I get tore up if they're heading towards like a main road and then, we watch everybody watches each other's dogs. I mean, I'm not out there to, if I've got six dogs with me that day, I'm not out there just to hunt and watch my six dogs. I put Kirk's dogs in, not all of them, but I'll put three or four of Kirk's dogs in my tracker. I'll put three or four dogs of the Markham's in my tracker. I'll put three or four of Chad's in my tracker. You know, you can put 20 dogs in, in your tracker. Well, with the new ones, you can put up to a hundred. And so you're, you, everybody's watching out for everybody when it, when it comes to the dogs, cause that's, that's the main focus. So it's, it's, uh, on a normal day. I mean, you're watching that if you're a hound hunter and you're watching the screen on your GPS, you can pretty much tell what your dog's doing, what it's running. Uh, if it's not on a bear, if it's on a bear, if it's on a cat, if, if you know your dogs well enough, if you, if you spend enough time with your dogs, you're going to know if you're going to have a pretty good idea if they've jumped off the track and got on a coyote track, if they've got on a deer track. I mean, the dogs, those animals run differently than bears. Yeah. When Which is crazy. Dogs. Yeah. I know, Which I know y'all are probably thinking like, man, what the hell is he saying? And, but, but you can see that on your tracker. Uh, you can pretty much say, Hey, I, you know, I think, I think my dog's running the wrong thing by, by the looks of the GPS. Yeah. Just the way it runs, animals run differently. Um, like a coyote, if say you're going and a bear, a bear seems to just want straight lines. Like he'll go one, he'll go down in the bottom of the holler, come straight up the other side, just keep going and rolling smoothly. A deer, you're watching them on the Garmin, they'll throw circles. Um, that they typically don't want to just beeline out of there and a coyote, a dead giveaway for if you're running a coyote. And this is obviously you don't want to run this stuff. So I've learned this stuff <laughs> yeah. from, from bad experiences, you know, from, from trying to train dogs. A coyote will hit a road and they love running roads. Um, so like if you see a, if you know where those roads are at and you're watching your tracker and then boom, that whatever you're running, you're watching that you're, you're obviously not tracking the animal, you're tracking the dogs, which the dogs will tell you you know, where the, where the animals went and I see them hit a road and they run that road for a half a mile. I'm like, Oh gosh, you know, <laughs> they went from, I'm all excited. They're running a bear to we're running a coyote. 
So, and it, and that's just something you learn with time, but I do, I, I Josh will tell you, I get pretty anxious. Uh, <laughs> I'm on, I'm on my uh, Garmin watching every single move they make. Uh, one, because obviously I don't want anything to happen to the dogs. <laughs> um, they're, uh, like I said before, they're, they're an extension of my family, but also I just, there's something about watching, like li- even listening to, to the race to see what's going on. Uh, it's from the time I cut loose until the conclusions happen, whether it be they're in the tree or they're bait up with it or, or, or the bear's dead or the mountain lion's dead. I'm on, I'm, I'm, I'm not playing around. Like I'm, I'm in serious mode, uh, because you know, there's just a lot at stake when you cut loose, when you cut your, I mean, it's crazy to think you cut dogs loose and they'll be miles from you and you've got almost no control of what happens. You do get anxious, you know? Like you'll see in the first Vortex Selects video, Bliss had that cat made up on the edge of that canyon wall. And I mean, I was absolutely, I'd never, that's stuff I'd seen on Instagram, you know, or on Facebook of a viral video of a, of a cat made up on the edge of a canyon wall. And behind that cat is a straight, like 300 foot drop off. You know, when you get, when you're from West Virginia, one, I've never even looked over the edge of a canyon. Two, my dog's there, you know, bait up. And in the video, I'm sure I seemed more relaxed than I, than I really was, but I was absolutely tore up. Like it was, it was a rush. You you played it pretty cool. You played <laughs> very, <laughs> very impressive. Yes, he wasn't he wasn't cool on the radio. They must not he must not put that in there. <laughs> That's what happens when he's got editing privileges, Josh. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So and I were watching them. We're like, gosh, this guy is cool as a cucumber. Um, I was thinking crazy, but yeah. Yeah, there's that, that, there's that too. But, you know, maybe describe, maybe go into a little bit, and, and I know you just touched on some of that, but like w- describe that process. Like, okay, you've got the dogs loaded up, you know, and now you guys are trying to find a track. Like, how are you trying to find that track? What happens when you find that track? You know, how you determine the freshness of that track? And then all the way to the point where you go, yep, this is one we're going to try and run. Uh, well, I mean, well if, if Josh, if, if you want me to do bear, you can, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll describe a bear and you do mountain lion. Cause we kind of yeah, treat that, them a little bit yeah, differently. That's, okay. what was, that's what I was going to say. So in West Virginia, um, it's not legal to bait bears and a lot of States. I don't know if Wisconsin's that way. I, I haven't looked it up, but I know for sure in Maine, you're allowed to run them off of bait sites. So what we do is, and you heard Josh mention it earlier, you got a rig rack and that's a rack that goes on top of your dog box. Um, and what you do is you put a few dogs and this is typically your, we call them rig dogs, the dogs that they're, they're, uh, in simple terms, they're able to smell really good. So if a bear's crossed there within a few hours, um, that dog should rig the track, which is crazy to think like a bear's just walked through there two hours ago. And that dog can smell that it's walked through there. So we'll put them on top of the truck and drive around Well, we're driving around in hollers. Um, we're driving around, uh, through grass, we're driving through, you know, a big ridge line full of oaks. We're trying to target where we think these bears might be. Well, then all of a sudden, boom, a dog rigs. So we then assess, I assess, I look, I kind of look back at them or listen to them. You know, I've got a trained ear because I've done it so much now, how, how hard they're barking, what dogs are barking, um, to determine how hot the track is. And like, to describe like what hot a hot track is just means a fresh track. Like say that bear's just been in there within, it could have been seconds ago or it could have been within minutes. Um, so if they're absolutely, the truck is shaking cause they, they're all barking. Then I'll, I'll put one or two down and watch them get it out of there real quick. And then I'll just turn them all loose. But say my best dog, for instance, if she rigs and she's the only one that's really, I can tell the other ones, they might be barking a little bit, but they're kind of like, I'm not sure, you know, what's going on here. I'm just kind of barking because she's barking. Uh, I'll put her down and let her pick the track out. So she'll go and it might take her a while. We got to think they can smell the track. They have to determine which way the track is going. Some dogs might get lucky and get it right the first time, but sometimes they'll get down there and there'll be an older track. They got to, they'll go out one way for a while, realize that track's getting colder and colder and colder. And those dogs are smart enough to know, it's getting less and less and less as I go turn around and come back. So you got to let them get down there and work the track out, figure it out as they start barking more. And we can tell by the way they're acting that it's getting hotter and hotter. We'll start putting dogs into it. 
whether it could be a mile from there or it could be uh, within a few hundred yards, you know? So it's all, and, and then you're, 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 you're letting dogs loose. So you might empty the whole truck. Say you turn every one of them loose within well, everybody say, I'm just by myself and I do it. Well, then Josh is trying to track, he's tracking those dogs too. So he's then trying to get his truck or uh, whatever he's in, he's trying to get in front of those dogs to get wherever the bear crosses to add his dogs to the race. Uh, and with, with a few years ago, it wasn't legal to do that in West Virginia. You were only allowed to, whatever dogs you initially put in the race, those dogs had to be the only dogs that finished the race. You weren't allowed to like cut in. That's, that's the term. So Josh is then trying to put his dogs into the, to the uh, race. So say he gets his dogs in there, the, it crosses a road, he dumps the box, they all take off. By that point, obviously, it's a steaming hot track because the bear's running from the dogs. And then they get it to where they get it in a tree or they bay him up or uh, whatever. But it's all different. And like Josh is about to explain, mountain lion is entirely different than that, especially the beginning. Yeah, so on the mountain, like on the on the bears, like Kirk was talking about, we are, we're dependent on the on the dogs – 90 percent of the time to to tell us if a bear has crossed there or, or they if they cross the track now if it, there's snow on the ground here and we're hunting the snow we are continuously even if we're rigging we're continuously looking for tracks in the snow but when we're mountain lion hunting we're pretty much getting up at two o'clock in the morning after getting in at midnight from hunting the day before or whatever time we get in, I mean, we're getting up so we can be the first ones. And we're trying to, our trips out West, we are, we are like, golly, attention to detail, watching the weather and what's coming. Cause we're wanting to get there when the snow is on the ground, dry ground hunting for mountain lions. I can imagine it being fun if you were out there all the time, but I did it in, um, in 16, I went out and dry ground hunted and hunting for nine days and it was a it was a, a rough nine days um so we try to go when there's weather when there's snow on the ground and we try to be the first ones into an area and breaking track in uh on on the snow so we get in the trucks and we drive the roads we start driving the roads it will split up if we've got more than one truck and we're looking for a track and if we find a track early in the morning, we might mark that track on our GPS and keep on going. Uh, or we might sit on that track. If it's a good track, if it's a, if it's a, what we think is a nice time track, we'll park right on that track. Uh, or maybe go around and see if there's, if there's another road close to us to see if we cross it again. But most of it, we're depending on our site to, to initially find the track and then once once it breaks daylight you know we'll put put a dog on the track see how they feel about it you can always tell what they're doing but if they're having a hard time which you'll see in the videos you know i'm kind of the truck boss at my age now <laughs> and kirk kind of the ground guy so kirk starts walking the track and if he sees that the dogs are getting off and he's on the track and there's no dog track he he controls the dogs and gets them back to him and he will continuously walk that track until it gets warm enough that the dogs will start taking it on their own. Yeah. And, and, and not to get off, not to get off subject there, but, um, when like, for instance, there'll be, sometimes we'll find a track and maybe it's a really good track. It'll be so old that I know there's no way it's been melted in the sun's hit it and stuff. There's no way the dogs can take it out of there. I'll just, he'll drop me off and they'll keep hunting around. And I'll yeah. stay in radio. They'll try to stay in radio communication on me. And I would just walk and walk and walk until, until I feel like the dogs can get it out of there. But it's pretty cool seeing, you know, when there's good snow, what that cat's doing. Uh, it, 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 you know, they'll, they may be, I, what I found this last trip is they really like to walk Canyon edges and I'm not sure why, you know, we're not, we're definitely not expert mountain lion hunters by any means. I mean, we're from West Virginia. Uh, we only get to hunt them that week we're going out there. So we're constantly learning, trying to learn more about it. But it was pretty awesome seeing those cats. One, if you find mule deer, most of the time you're going to find cats. That seems to be like their their species of, of choice as far as hunting. Um, but 
I was, I was walking these edges and these cats were just trailing all like they would, they would walk the entire Canyon edge all the way around, you know, all the way up to the head of it. And it's like, they're looking over, but the, you know, they also can see what's to the right of them. I'm not sure why they, they did that, but uh, there was one time where I was trailing this cat and he walked back. I could see where he went over this hill and there was an undercut underneath me. I could tell it was a cave. And the whole time I'm thinking, you know, I wonder how old this track is exactly. <laughs> and I'm wondering if he's in there because he could just be laid up in there for, I don't know how many hours. Uh, so I popped my head in there and luckily I could see the track coming back out. Uh, but that's, it's just cool again to experience all that. Like I found a huge, I've actually, let me grab it real, real quick. I know the listeners can't hear it, uh, but I'm going to show you all. Yeah. I found a huge mule deer shed uh, in that the cat had stepped on. Like he, his track was literally stepped on. Oh my gosh. Ooh. Yeah. And so you get to experience all kinds of, of cool stuff like that. Like look at those, those bases. I mean, they are, it, it, it was a, Dude, that is a, <laughs> it was a monster shed. Massy horn. That is cool. Man. Yeah. And that's just, you, yeah. just like you, you're not even with the dogs at that point. Then you were just kind of walking that no. track out. Just walking, like they'll drop me off and I will walk till the end, like literally as far as I can walk. And walking in snow is not easy to do. No. Uh, it's not easy at all. So you got to be in shape. Like that's another thing I get, I crack up. People will be like, you all are just a bunch of fat, uh, lazy hunters turning dogs loose or whatever. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I don't know what you're talking about. You come with me for a day and I promise you, you'll be gutted. So I'm, you know, I'm, unless I'm, you're some Olympic athlete. <laughs> I'm not going to give away the video. Go check out the Vortex Selects episode. But there was one point in particular where what I would consider, and I'm not a hound owner, a close encounter where you see the cat and you see the dogs. So I kind of asked the anxiety question before, but I think to someone not familiar with it, they would be like, why isn't that cat just popping up and killing those dogs or, or just running out of there? So what... What exactly is happening in a moment like that? So you've got a bear in a tree. Maybe sometimes you got a cat in a tree. But for this particular instance, I don't know what the yardage was. It, it was kind of hard to tell. I know it was close. So what's what's going through your mind and, and just knowing the behavior of bears and cats? Why are they just pinned down to two or three dogs that are much smaller than them? Would probably be no match for a cat. You've got you standing there. Well, what's happening there? Cats, for one, they're... Uh, they have to stop every so often, no matter what, because they don't have the lungs that a bear has. Uh, I think a lot of bears, they'll stay there bait up, but you're not going to hold a bear. A bear is totally different from a cat, I, in, in my opinion. Um, I've seen bears get held up for a while, but like that, I really think if, if Kirk wouldn't have shot that cat, that cat would have stayed right there on that, that, that location where he was at, he would have stayed there for another hour. I mean, I've seen, I've seen cats in trees for two hours at a time. They don't move, but you know, bear, he's going to go up a tree and he's going to get his lungs about him and get his wind. And most likely he's going to come down at some point and take back off. I mean, I've seen cats just lay up there. I mean, they just, it's like they, once once they get caught, it just they have a different mentality. Like they're like, man, those yapping things scare us to death. Right. That's a, a thing. Is like I don't think they've ever been. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's there's no predator to them like like predator to for them in the woods like that. That's putting pressure on. That's clearly not afraid of them. I think it's almost like culture shock to them. Like I'm the biggest and baddest here, and then all of a sudden somebody's coming at me full tilt, and there's a bunch of you know, piranha looking things yapping at me. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and it, it's different. Um, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, you've got people walking around the street that someone may look big and bad and stuff, but they are, you know, they're, they're a wimp. There's no way they could beat you up or whatever. And then you got the normal looking dude that can absolutely, you, you don't know it, but he's, he's a black belt in jujitsu. And it's the same way with these cats and they've got different mentalities. Like some of them have Mike Tyson mentalities, or, or especially bears. They got Mike Tyson. They're not going in the tree, no matter what they're not stopping. They're not afraid to fight. And then you've got ones that look big and bad, but they're not like, they'll just, they'll climb up a tree. Like we've treed 425 pound uh, black bears. And then we've walked bears that are a hundred pounds that will not tree. Um, so it's all up to the, to the individual. That's, that's a good question though. 
is like that's what people are say, say to me especially with bliss in these videos like she's a lot of times one-on-one -on -one with these animals and especially the last time like it is the, the last time in the selects you'll see is a monster the biggest cat i've ever seen in a tree and a 38 pound dog put it there you know you're like why don't these things come out and i i think it's they do possess the ability to kill them if they wanted to, but it's like, they just, some reason they don't. And, and, and it's like, they don't want to, they don't want that conflict. And I think that's a big point of emphasis is some people might see that and be like, Oh, that's just total disregard for your dogs. Like, why are you putting them in that situation? But I think your comfort level with knowing the style of hunting and knowing your dogs, you know, that, um, I mean, from an odds perspective, like those dogs are good to go. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm more worried about human error, whether it be trucks, uh, I mean, highways, roads. I'm more worried about them getting hit by a vehicle or say the bear is bait up and someone places a bad shot and takes a you know irresponsible shot and, uh, and, and hits a dog or something. I'm more worried about the human factors than I am the animal. Like since I've been doing this, there hasn't been a single dog killed by an animal. Like where the animal is solely like, uh, responsible for it since I've been hound hunting, not a single one. So is, it's very rare for that to happen. Is that common as a whole, or is is that just with with you guys? Do you hear much about hounds getting getting killed on a hunt every, like that? Every now and then. Now, like I said, any dog could get in a bad situation. Say that this this cat is back in a hole and it falls in that hole for whatever reason with that with that mountain lion or bear. That is not going to be a good outcome. Um, so there is there are. I don't want to seem like make it sound like dogs don't ever get killed by an animal. It does happen, but there are things you can do. I like getting there to them quick as you can to decrease your odds of something like that happening, you know, not playing around with it. That's like with bliss. I let her bay up when I got there, bay up on that cat for a little while. And then I put a lead on her and held her back from it just so to make sure nothing would happen. Mm -hmm. And that all goes into the training too. Like that cave situation, like there are things you can do to, to train your dogs to not just go tearing in there after something too. Right. Right. And the ones that, you know, once again, you'll have really aggressive dogs that don't have any sense about them. They're not afraid of anything, which I think is cool. But at the same time, it's like, you want a dog that's smart, you know, he's not afraid to, to put pressure on the bear, but he's also not going in there balls to the wall, uh, getting himself killed. Yep. Yep. What's that? So what's that, what's that process look like when, you got a, you know, a, uh, a bear in a tree or maybe you got a lion in the tree. Like, how are you, how are you like, you know, ensuring the safety of those dogs kind of at that, that moment of truth time. Once the animal's caught, if it's in a tree, as soon as we get, we, we try to get in there, obviously as fast as possible, uh, the shortest distance. And once we get in there, we, you know, judge the situation and then, we tie the dog, we start tying the dogs back, you know, immediately uh, yeah. to get them out of the danger if, if the animal does come out of the tree. So, you know, the first, the, the first thing we're worried about is getting the dogs tied up and, and getting them away from the tree. And, and, and even if, say, that bear does come out and they're not tied back, all that's going to happen is the bear's just going to take off. And this is, I'm going to say, 99% of the time, the bear's just going to take off and the dog's just going to continue chasing it. And then the chances are they're just going to run it up another tree. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, so there's not a really, I'm not worried about it at all. If the bear comes out, I'm not worried at all. Like I've heard of very few circumstances where the bear comes out and then like, say the bear goes after a dog that's tied up on a tree. Most of the time they're just trying to get away, get away, get away. You know, they don't want to fight. All they want to do is get away. Yeah. By them fighting means they're having to stay in that, that situation longer. Mm -hmm. So I guess if there are like one or two things, I know we've covered a lot of ground here and we tried to like cover some of the misconceptions if there are you meet somebody on the street who is either totally unfamiliar or or maybe anti hound hunting what what are kind of those one or two huge things that you would want them to know knowing that when you leave that interaction you might have either an ally or someone that is in a better place than they were before uh for me i want them to know that for one we care about the dogs um i feel like a lot of people don't think we care about them and that is not, you know, that's not the case at all. We care about the dogs. Also, it's a huge, like, like we talked about earlier, it's a huge part of conservation. Um, 
there's quotas set by people a lot smarter than us um, that are that are constantly studying these animals, and uh, there's a certain number of them that get killed. And 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 with hound hunting, like we said earlier, um, when you tree one, you're able to determine, you know, somewhat of the age, how mature it is, and you're able to determine male and female. Um, and also, I want them to understand that these dogs aren't just you just can't go to the pound or you or you just can't just buy, you know, whatever dog, a black lab or German shepherd or whatever, and do what we're doing with these dogs. We spend so much time training them and we're not just turning dogs loose and hoping they catch it. You know, there's a lot that goes into it that doesn't always get shown or, or displayed. Yeah. And for me, if I was talking to, if I was talking to a person in the outdoors and I've, I've kind of just, rode the coattails of uh, Clay Newcomb after talking and becoming good buddies with him as, as I would tell him, hey, you need to support us no matter what because we're the low hanging fruit. And once all our fruits picked off the tree, they're going to come, they're, they're going to go on up the tree and it could be, you know, rabbit hunting or, or, or some sort of uh, legislation for elk hunting or deer hunting or whatever. So I would tell the, somebody in the outdoor industry that, you know, they need to be in full support of us like we are of them because we are the low hanging fruit in the outdoor industry. And it's, and it's very low. It's easy to pick off. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a very vulnerable part of, of, uh, of the industry that we're in. So I, I would, I would try to gain support in protecting that low hanging fruit. So it doesn't get to the, fruit in the top of the tree because that's what it'll do just like you were saying those pieces they just get chipped away and chipped away well once once that bottom rung of fruit's gone then they're just going to move on up yeah for for a non-hunter non-outdoor person um for me i would probably reflect and tell them uh about my son brody and what it's done for for to get him involved in the outdoors He's never killed anything. He's there for the dogs. He takes care of our dogs. He feeds them every day. He gives them shots at the first of the month. I mean, you're talking about a 12 year old. Um, and I would tell them that, you know, the focus on the dogs and mine and Brody's relationship as a father and son is what I would focus on. And that, you know, that's what it's all about is getting your kids out there with you and, and doing something with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a big deal, man. Yeah. I mean, that's like, obviously that's forging a relationship between the two of you. That's very strong, but that's teaching him. I mean, countless things, you know, as far as oh, yeah. you know, responsibility and taking care of a dog. I mean, they say actually for kids, like even just having, having a house dog is like one of the best things you can do for a kid. And I mean, you guys got, you know, how many dogs and just, you know, so many extra, you know, layers to the care of those dogs and the training for those dogs. I mean, that that's cool stuff. Like, I guarantee he's learning more than anybody knows from that. Yeah, and that's why I think you guys are so critical to the future of the sport, too, because I think going back to the YouTube comments and those interactions, a lot of people in that situation will get negative, they'll get defensive, they'll get angry, and that's just going to shut them down more. So I think we need more people like you that are able to – uh, either meet in the middle or have a constructive conversation around this yeah. stuff because I think that's going to do do more good than er than anything. You can you can show people a screenshot of of you ripping someone apart who's anti hunting and you two you two guys are going to maybe find that funny, but that screenshot can go a lot of other places. Well, and and you, and you haven't had that open conversation that could you know maybe a person may never participate. But at least they'll have a better understanding about it. And 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 one other thing I wanted that we kind of didn't point out that I think is important to point out, um, you can eat these animals. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah. I think bears are definitely, you know, they're they're in the spotlight right now as far as you know, um, people are doing a really good job of of telling that story of bear meat and how good it is. Um, I like I like mountain lion meat better than I do bear meat. That's what I was gonna say. But I think a lot of people don't know mm -hmm. that you can eat a mountain lion. Mm -hmm. Oh, you right. absolutely can. Yeah, and I'm glad y'all brought that up. That's a great point, and that is something that you should mention to anyone that's curious about it um, and wants to know more about it. Is you absolutely can eat bears, and it's some of the best meat you can you can eat, in my opinion. Like we use it for all kinds of different stuff, uh, and and like Josh, um, he donates a ton of his bear meat to the, the, uh, the shelters. 
What's uh, what's what's your favorite ba- uh, barren line recipe? Okay, I mean, I, I mean, I, I definitely do the line. Mine, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, I like the lines backstraps, and we'll cook it as as a as a as actually like a like a pork loin because mm-hmm. it's got some of the same texture as pork. It's really clean. It's white. You know, it's it's a really nice meat. Uh, it it does have some fil- silver back in it that that you're just not going to cook. It's not going to soften up. You know, like in a New York strip, you'll have the fat that that softens up and and it kind of melts in your mouth. And then you'll have that silver back that you're just not going to. Mm-hmm. You just cut around it. But it's really good meat. And then you know we'll cook a por- pork loin or or we'll I'll slice it up into boneless pork chops, and. It's crazy because you know a lot of people are like, man, you're eating a, you know, you're eating a feline, you know, you're you're eating a cat, and once you get past that, I mean, it is really good meat. I mean, my wife eats it, my son. Uh, we had several people uh, of our friends, hunters and non-hunters, uh, come over and try it, and everybody's liked it. So I'm a big pork chop guy, so I like slicing them up for pork chops. And yep. uh, and grilling them that way. Josh, do you have yep. a uh, favorite whiskey pairing with uh, Mountain Lion? Well, just depends on what I'm wanting to drink that <laughs> evening. <laughs> oh, whether whether I'm wanting to have something light, or if I want something hot, hot because I, I you know I'm a barrel proof guy. So, uh, I, I if I had to choose one to drink, it'd probably be a Weller Antique 107. That's that's what I was gonna say. Yep, me too. Not to get specific. <laughs> <laughs> On the bear subject, um, for a quick meal, we like uh, bear burger tacos. Um, really good way to use the burger. Um, and then we also make I call it bear burger helper. Not a lot of times I post those just because they're appealing to the eye. And, you know, you got hamburger helper. You can go get at your local grocery store or whatever. And we just throw in bear burger helper. You cannot taste the difference from that and beef at all. Uh, and it's a great it's a great way just to, to use it. Um, we do that a lot with it. And then another way is like I get it cut up in three different ways. Bear burger because we use a lot of burger and I never have to go to the store and buy a burger. Um, also roast. We'll put it in like an instant pot or you can put it in a crock pot. Low and slow, we're in the instant pot, you know, you don't have to worry about low and slow, but it, you can put it in there for like 30 minutes with a bunch of vegetables and stuff like that. And I'm telling you, it comes out pulling apart. It's delicious. It, it's a great roast. And then uh, stew meat, we use it in like vegetable soup and stuff like that. So that's the three different ways. I'm not big on like bare steaks. You know, I'm not going to go out there and throw it on the grill like you would a filet uh, or anything like that. But um, yeah, that's just some of the ways I like to eat it. And as long as you, you know, I think it depends on how you cook it. You know, you can eat any game meat or you can eat any any cow or whatever that doesn't taste good. But it depends on how you, you know, how you cook it. No, for sure. Well, I can tell you this, guys. We are approaching lunchtime, and you have definitely <laughs> made me super hungry. That all sounds, sounds way good right now. Yeah, I mean, all I need is between 5 and 12 dogs, collars, a uh, uh, rig rack for my truck and we can just go do it. Yeah, simple. Why don't we uh, well, why don't we grab a bite and then on the yes. rest of our lunch break we'll just go get get the rest of the gear for it. Okay. <laughs> probably just be probably just be a whole lot easier for y'all to jump in the truck for a real long weekend and drive to West Virginia for a few days. God, I so hope yeah. say that. That's happening. That is happening. 100%. No, that, seriously, that, y'all need y'all need to come down for sure. Hey, I, I know, but we've been saying we're gonna come up there too. So maybe we'll just meet in the middle and just have a big vortex. Yeah, Josh. <laughs> the reason I asked that whiskey question, I just wanted to see what you had right now. <laughs> that's hey. de- that's determining my timeline. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I was just at his house the other day, and he's got a big <laughs> in this kitchen. He's got a big barrel cut in the half, and I'm telling you, there is ten thousand dollars for the bourbon. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how long's that drive? <laughs> it ain't that long. We'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not too long. Yeah, that's yeah. No, that will that will happen. That's something we've had on the radar for a long time. I think from our end, we're we're just happy to to be able to make your guys' platform a little bigger. Um, I think whatever we can do to help to continue that constructive conversation, I think is is going to be a big thing and. We've got this Vortex Select series that that uh, we've got coming up that I think you guys are everyone's really gonna like. I think it's gonna be very enlightening. But even the conversations we had before that, 
what questions do we need to prepare for, how can we head that off in the past, and things that you guys are going to do in the video. So I think just the amount of thought that you guys put into what goes into a video and how you talk about it, I think is is notable in this industry because I think a lot of people don't take that that level of care. Well, and, the, and then with that, they're just they're not getting the rest of the story. You know, I always say, like, as a hunter, you know the story. You know the whole story. You know the A to Z. You know that that animal went in your freezer. You know what it took to get there. And in a lot of content, like, honestly, it'd be like a super slow burner if you tried to tell that whole story. You know, like, oh, let's tell the, the, the five years that it took to train, you know, my dogs. And finally got, it's like, you know, you just don't. So, I mean, I think, but like Sir said, you guys are doing an awesome job of that. And we certainly appreciate you guys and everything that you're doing and appreciate you guys as, as just as, as people as well. We really uh, always enjoy chatting with you and uh, looking forward to the next one. So Yeah, for hunters yeah. listening, we're all in this together. We harped on it quite a bit, but, mm-hmm. man, you got to support other hunters. Yeah. That's the yeah. bottom line. And for you yeah. know any, anybody listening out there, we appreciate you listening. If you have any further questions, let us know, or additional questions or things that we didn't touch on or something you might want more information about or more information on hound, hound hunting. If you're so inclined to get into it, just uh, just let us know. Yeah, we'll have a blog with these guys. They sat down with Mike on our team and had a, a really nice conversation mm-hmm. about why it is they do what they do if you prefer written form. Obviously, we got the podcast here. We'll have the Vortex Select series. Mm-hmm. We'll be doing some stuff on social that will give people a very easy venue to ask questions and kind of interact directly. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it. If you're not learning more at this point, it's on you. Like they're putting them, they're putting themselves out there. Like it's, it, they're out there to ask questions to, which a lot of people don't do. So yeah, you know, take advantage of it. Take advantage of it, and and get, you know, thanks again for for you guys putting yourself out there because I mean that that is you are putting yourself in a position where you may get all all types of comments, you know, positive and negative. So that t- that's uh, you know takes a level of uh, of courage and dedication. To whiskey, it, lots of whiskey, a little bit too. of whiskey. Yep. Yeah, you can throw that and always uh, <laughs> add a little bit of that. But uh, no, so yeah, thank you guys. For for everything hey thank you all like like i said earlier we really appreciate vortex supporting one supporting us but also supporting hound hunting i mean i think it says a lot about you all because a lot of companies they will just avoid this conversation altogether because that's the safe bet but i think what you all are doing for us and the hound hunting community you know i hope it doesn't go unnoticed and we really appreciate it awesome, happy to guys. do it happy to do it yep thanks guys appreciate it Uh, everybody else there, thank you for listening and until next time, happy hunting. There you have it folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it, comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it at Vortex Nation podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.